Today is February 22nd, 2021. Thanks for stopping by to hang out on the Simple Kicking Show with Presley Harvin. But before we get into the best punter in college football, let's talk about Big Game USA. Big Game manufactures footballs for many high school and college programs, and they make them right here in Dallas, Texas. I've been kicking this football for a long time, and it's been consistent for a decade. And I know what's going to happen with the ball. When I'm over the spot, all I'm focusing on is my target and the swing to produce it. To receive 10% off your order, please go to BigGameUSA.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click Kicker Footballs. Enter the promo code SIMPLEKICK2021. Again, that is SIMPLEKICK2021 for 10% off your kicking football order. You know, and I, I I told myself beforehand, I was like, look, like I'm a freshman, I'm young, I still got to learn the ropes. Let me do it the right way. Let me get guided by guys instead of worrying about who's going to play, who's not going to play. And <laughs> I mean, I was definitely truly blessed to throw that touchdown. And to be honest, if I had to throw one or run one, I want to run one this time. And to man, just keep grinding. Times are hard, but you know, hard work comes in the hardest times of your life, which is right now throughout this pandemic stuff we've been dealing with and all. So just continue to have that one step forward and you just keep working. According to the Simple Kicking Index, Presley Harvin is the most improved punter in college football. Plus, he won the 2020 Ray Guy Award. So what's behind all of this success? Hard work and a lot of fun. Hit the theme, Lee. Welcome to Simple Kicking with your host, James Harrison. Like we were talking in pre-show, you've got such an incredible journey and You've worked so incredibly hard at it. Uh, I've been kicking now for, I, I can't even remember how long, I think eight plus years or so. And, you know, just being able to look back from, you know, where I began my career at in middle school and to see where I actually am today, man, it's, it's, it's really, really, you know, something I'm gonna always be able to look back on and be appreciative of all of the hard work that I've done to put me in positions today to where, you know, I'm going to the next level, hopefully, and be able to change me and my family's lives forever. All right, let's put it this way. You start in like South Carolina, Alcola, South Carolina? Uh, it's, it's pronounced Alcalu, actually. It's a little bit different. Uh, kind of got like that Southern slang to it. <laughs> small town. Uh, so I was born and raised there. I was. It's a small little town. I think it doesn't even have a traffic light, matter of fact. It's like one gas station off of the interstate, a whole bunch of churches, cornfields, and that's really about all you get. Can you ride a horse? <laughs> You can if you got one. I don't, I actually don't have one. Uh, <laughs> been looking forward to trying to ride one one day. But so small town kid, you get a kicking coach, and it sounds like Jamie Cole puts you in the top two. What's that recruiting process like? It was it was a complete experience, man. Because uh, when I first originally started out, uh, I started out in seventh grade kicking, but I didn't get coaching until my freshman year of high school. So when that time came, it was more so of, you know, I got put on the varsity team a little bit earlier just for the the depth perception of like, you know, being able to learn from the guys that's ahead of me. And, uh, you know, I talked to my mom one day and I was just like, you know, I want to take this full time instead of playing other positions. I also played tight end at the time. So, you know, took punting full time. I started getting training. So, you know, I took an extreme amount of time and effort and out our first off season to be able to get, you know, to where I feel like I was comfortable enough to go on a big stage and do well. And the rest is really just history ever since then, man. I just, it, was, it was a lot of hard work done, and I was able to be uh, ranked highest in my class at that time. I, I think I was 16 years old when I went up there. And after I left that camp, it was kind of like some, like a lot of people started to know who I was. But, you know, you, you don't really get that from just going to the camp. You got to put the hard work in behind it. And, you know, just ever since that experience, that first camp that I went to, it was just uphill, uh, uphill battle from then because uh, I think I was the first underclassman to win that camp. And ever since then, I just felt like I had a target on my back and just continuing to put in hard work year in and year out, go up there, you know, showcase all of the talents that I have and just all of the hard work that I put in from camp to camp. So Austin McNamara is the punter at Texas Tech, and he and his dad have a little slogan, which is hashtag hard work pays off. I mean, you've said hard work like five times already. A lot of people think that 
they see the outside of something and that's just the only thing they see kind of like the the iceberg image i have in my head like where you see the top of the iceberg it's just the showcasing of all of the good talents the awards the accolades but you have this big glacier that's underneath it that you don't even see that you know in order to get this mountain part at the top to be able to be shown it's a lot down low and you know that's just really what hard work was for me because coming from a small town i didn't really have opportunities to have a lot of training camps with coaches and uh where i went to school at because i was i went to school about 20 20 minutes away from alkaloo but it was still a small town and you know the nearest kicking coach that i had from Coles or anybody that's like professional was like an hour so you know i was never able to get as much like one-on-one -on -one time with a lot of coaches i just had to write down a lot of notes a lot of film work that i've been sending and stuff like that to be able to you know get the coaching that i need from a distance so you know being able to do it on my own it showed me like the maturity level that i was going to have to have to have this on my own because now that the level that i just finished playing at which was collegiate you are your own coach you don't have a kicking coach on staff you don't really have anyone in the in the facilities that know really just about anything that you're supposed to to be able to kick so you know i was actually kind of my own coach as well as my mom was at a younger age and it kind of taught me you know what am i doing wrong how can i fix it i can fix it on the fly and you know just the hard work behind like all of that work that i did you know hard work pays off just like that slogan says so how was mom and dad helpful for you in this process <sighs> my mom was really my first coach so uh i remember back my freshman year we actually came to a training camp in atlanta that was a coach visual training and that was the first day that both of us actually found out like kind of the backbone behind the art of punting and ever since that camp i'm talking about she wrote from head to toe in the back of the notes part of that book every single detail i needed to know and just ever since that moment man my, my mom has been along the way the whole time uh like a lot of people be like you know who's your first kicking coach and i say my mom they're like really because i'm pretty sure your mom doesn't know how to punt but we kind of learned together uh my dad was there, my dad was there every step of the way also and you know you know, we all have guides on our way, on our journeys, and it's it's so funny. I mean, at 15, 16, there's a really easy way to just say, Mom, Dad, I got it. You know, like, I don't need your advice. And you're saying your mom was your first kicking coach. Yeah, like, it was. it's a little bit weird at first because, you know, everyone wants to listen to their mom. But when it comes to something she can't do, you're like, look, I know a little bit more than you. Why don't I try to do it myself? But, you know, I, I learned quickly with that especially like just having the raw talent of just having a strong leg and nothing else <laughs> i had to have as much hope as i could get so i took it serious uh she can even attest to that sometimes it was hard sometimes it was a little bit easier but you know just being able to have her on the field with me it was a lot different than a lot of other specialists could say too so how in the world do you get a college scholarship a full scholarship uh so coming out of south carolina i was recruited by Clemson as well as South Carolina and Clemson actually had first dibs on me uh coach Sweeney you know as we all know Clemson's a very very good team the weird thing about it was I didn't get an offer from either one of those schools the only school I actually got an offer from was actually Georgia Tech and the recruiting process was rough because I went to multiple different college camps like all specialists should be able to do in the off season and get it get that exposure but it just, I had the exposure, it was just nothing else was coming behind it. And throughout the whole process, throughout high school of recruiting, Tech was the only school to actually continuously come back and, you know, ask me how I'm doing, send letters in the mail, like personalized mail, instead of something like generic that they send to all recruits. And Coach Johnson and his staff really took me under their wing early, and I was actually able to commit, I believe, the spring of my junior year which is really really early so uh, i graduated high school in 2017 so i think it was like february or march of 2016 i actually committed and ever since that day that i got the offer back in the earlier february i told myself i was like look like this school is a win-win Ex excellent academics because my mom always told me no matter what academics is first uh this is one of the most prestigious uh institutions in america uh and then you have downtown Atlanta where you can have no other type of college backdrop, no other type of city that has the culture like Atlanta does. 
then you also have the community. I'm also in the car, so I looked at the car community side of things. I also looked into like you know different things that tech had to offer off the off the field, uh, and it was just a it was just a win win because I also wasn't too close from home, too far from home, uh, just about four and a half hours away, and you know. If I had to make this decision again, I'd choose this one every single time. Cause. So this is Presley Harvin the third, and you're known back home by Mama, and your family is Trey. Look, I get DMs from guys saying, "Hey, I'm I, I just want to kick the ball farther so that I can you know show more tape on social media so I can get a scholarship." And the thing is about like college football, at least from my experience, because I got a taste of what you had at Georgia Tech, which was at Rice, I got, you know, a world-class education. You really want to not just think about just D1 and and scholarship, right? You want to think about all the things that you talked about. Man, they've got an awesome community. They've got an awesome car community. It's Atlanta. I mean, how do you not get a job in in an amazing city that has, you know, 10 million plus in the greater Atlanta metro? I mean, it's an incredible, incredible spot. So for those that are thinking about recruiting out there, dude, listen to this story, right? It's not all about scholarship. I mean, this was his only offer. And looking back, guys, this is probably a guy that's going to be in the NFL for a really, really long time. So if, you know, for those guys that are listening, go to the kicking camps, but be patient. Be patient. Yeah, because patience is key with this because, you know, you can be a – four or five star recruit coming out of high school that plays wide receiver. You can have 20 offers in your sophomore year. But, you know, I was an early bird with the process and I actually was able to get a scholarship offer really, really early in my career. But I know countless of other specialists that weren't even able to get an actual offer besides a preferred walk on offer coming into school and then earning one. So, I mean, the, the road is different for every single specialist out there. And for all of those that are listening, you know, the time is coming. You just have to be patient because everyone's road's a little bit different. So was that Tim McGrath and Lamar Owens that was uh, recruiting you? Yeah, so Tim, uh, still a really, really good guy of mine. I love Tim to death, especially Coach Owens also. Uh, but actually, I got recruited off uh, the offensive lineman coach at the time, Mike Seawalk. And I uh, was actually able to meet Tim and uh, Coach Owens early on in the process when I went to that kicking camp they had over the off season uh, as a junior when I went. And, you know, those three guys, they took me under their wing quick. And that's really what Georgia Tech was for me. It was just a big family. Dude, you go into Georgia Tech and you you earn a spot that that first game, Tennessee versus Georgia Tech. At the yeah, Dome. so uh, that was my first game I actually got to play in – it was the first game of the season, but I knew coming into it that just because I'm the punter that coming in on scholarship doesn't mean that, you know, anything's handed to me. And Coach Johnson and Tim and Coach Owens, we let that set into me real quick because we also had a lot of other punters there at the time, too. And, you know, I, I told myself, you know, I'm younger. A lot of other guys have had the experience of being on a team and winning and losing at the college level. And, you know, coming off of a hot horse out of high school, you know, I, I've never been the one to be cocky and tell myself, you know, I'm I'm the guy, you know, and I, I, I told myself beforehand, I was like, look, like I'm a freshman. I'm young. I still got to learn the ropes. Let me do it the right way. Let me get guided by guys instead of worrying about who's going to play, who's not going to play. And that's really how I got to be able to be the starting punter when I first came in, because, you know, I did it the right way. I didn't come and be like, well, I'm no I'm the only good punter here, so I might as well not worry about watching film with coaches. I might as well not even try to make relationship with other players on the team or other other punters because I don't want to make them think that I'm trying to get in their head. You know, I never I never had the big head aspect of it. I always stayed humble. I told myself, it was like, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I got four years here and I can potentially be that guy one day. And, you know, that first game in the Dome, uh, that was a completely different stage in any type of high school game I ever played coming out of a smaller town. And... You know, being in the Dome, working out uh, for a couple of practices before the game, it, it really opened my eyes to the college the college life and the college experience on the field. And uh, I can't remember how far the ball went, but I think my first punt was a 56-yarder in that game. And ever since then, you know, I've always strived to be like, you know what, I can do it at the big stage. I've always trained my whole – I trained the hardest I could – 
all of my life that I've been kicking to be able to do it on the big stage. And here I am now. And, you know, I, I kind of never let I kind of never let that sleep on me and, you know, just continue to try to get better year in and year out. And, you know, here I am today being, you know, truly blessed to be able to win the Ray Guy Award that I've been trying to win for the last four years. Dude, your freshman year, your first punt is a 56 yard moon rocket. That freshman year, you were named all ACC. Yeah. And that was, to be honest, I never even thought about any accolades my freshman year. I was just trying to help the team as much as I could. And, you know, being, being named that, uh, the ACC, I think I was third team my freshman year, but I think I was pretty high up in average that year. I think I averaged like 44, nine or something like that. I never thought about the accolades at first at all throughout that whole freshman year. And really, to be honest, from there on out, it was always just a, you know, each point I have, if it's good, how can I build on it? And if it's bad, how can I fix it and then build on it? And, you know, my mom always told me from a younger age, you know, you continue to do hard work and you do it the right way and you continue to stack on it, accolades will come. And that's exactly what happened after that freshman year. I never took any punt for granted, you know, because I had my good ones, I had my bad ones, but I always wanted to make sure that, you know, if I have another ball that I'm going to hit, I needed to be better than the last one. And that's really what I did freshman year. And just being named all ACC my freshman year as a freshman, you know, it was a complete honor. And, you know, that's just a lot more of testament of hard work. That year was long. Like, I've never played football from August or September to all the way in December when it's cold. Like, you know, high school football is a little bit different. We start early in August and then you'll end in, like, November, first week of December. And, you know, just being in the college level at that freshman year and, you know, having a lot of guys tell me, like, look, like, we appreciate you for all you're doing for the team. But just let you know, like, we're going to we're going to put you under our wing because we know you're young and, you know, we know what you can do for this team after we're gone. And, you know, a lot of those guys that have done that for me are still good friends for me today. You have 80 punts your sophomore year. And then fast forward to this year, dude, you are the like epitome of hard work because like you were the most improved punter from 2019 to 2020 in a year where you had every reason not to be the best punter. You had COVID, et cetera. What happened that caused you to improve 16.6% from 2019 to 2020? Just being able to be in a different environment is what really sparked me because, to be honest, I didn't know if we were going to play this year or if we weren't. And the biggest thing that I told myself was, no matter what, you know, how can I continue to get better? And, like, when we shut down back in the spring of my junior year, coming in a senior you know, we, we had no weight room. I had no coaching. I had nothing. It was just really just myself, my girlfriend, and our dog just sitting here every single day like, okay, we're, we're here and we don't know how long. What can we get better at? And, you know, she's big into running and stuff. And I told her, I was like, look, like, I don't care if we play football or not this year. I'm going to get better. So whenever that time comes that we start playing, I'm shocked the world. And that's exactly what we did that whole, I think it was like six or seven months we were gone from like, February all the way until like July and that's a lot of time that a lot of people didn't really take advantage of and you know I wanted to make sure I had the front the front kind of look on it and kind of have a step ahead when college football came back and you know those days of I would go out to a field and I get kicked off of it due to COVID because you know I might be the only one out there but they're like look we can't have anyone here Just facilities are shut down like I got kicked off of Bobby Dodge Stadium I got kicked off the field like three, four times in a row. And they're like, look, if you come back, you know, you're going to get in trouble. I'm like, you know, I, I, I understand that, but I still got work I got to do. And, you know, just those moments, I told myself, I was like, look, man, like nothing's guaranteed. Like that could have been, the, that literally could have been the last time I played football until really this year. And, you know, I took advantage of it and I just ran with it. Earlier, you were talking about the ACC, like everyone thinks of ACC and they just think Clemson, rightfully so. Clemson's won a bunch of national championships. They they win all, you know, blah, blah, blah. Dude, this, the ACC punting talent this year was stacked, dude. You had Lou Headley, who's simple kicking zone. He had a fantastic year and he was the sixth most improved in 2020. He finished three, number three on the simple kicking index. And then Kirk Christo was, he had a 97.9 rating on the simple kicking. 
he just dominated net punting and the number of punts inside the 20 was insane. Guys that finished outside the top four were um, Ben Kiernan over at North Carolina. Um, you had Porter Wilson at Duke and Anthony Pecarella. So you got these Aussies who are, you know, a lot older than you. Dude, you scored a 100.2. Now, the only, only other guy that balled out this year was Jack Martin. Who is that, right? Like, no one knows who, who, that, who that guy was. I, I, I didn't until somebody told me. But, dude, you averaged 48 yards a punt on 45 punts. Your net was 44.8. This is NFL numbers. And let me make one more point to show the world really how good you are. This 2020 season was ranked number 12 out of all seasons since 2013. And here are the guys that are ahead of you. Mitch Wisnowski, San Francisco 49ers. Michael Dixon, University of Texas, now with the Seattle Seahawks. Max Duffy, who's with the who's Simple Kicking Zone, he joined the podcast a couple weeks ago. He's a, a NFL draft prospect out of Kentucky. Braden Mann, who you talked about. Tom Hackett had a couple good seasons. Jimmy Smith, Cam Johnston, Tyson Dyer, and Joe Charlton, who's now with the Atlanta Falcons. Oh, forgot to mention, Cam is with the Philly Philadelphia Eagles and Braden's with the New York Jets. Dude, you're already in the club. Yeah, and that means a lot to me because – you know, all of those guys are still successful at the next level. And, you know, to see all of the hard work that those guys have put in and to see that, you know, they had the, all, all of the facilities and a lot of other coaching and stuff that I also didn't, I also didn't, was able to have. And, you know, just to see that, you know, pure hard work with no hands on, you know, it works every single time. And for all of the high, high school guys that are out there, I've been trying to do that since I was in high school to get to this level and just had to go back to my high school roots of doing it all over again. You know, it was just kind of like heartwarming because, you know, that's what I was, that's what I strived on when I first started kicking and to be able to get nationally ranked and be able to be nationally known at first. And I was just like, you know, if this is going to be the year to run the way guy, this got to be the year, you know, just being able to stay on a consistent level on the field of, you know, no matter what, let me hit my ball every single time just about. And like you said, that 48 yard average, it doesn't come easy. Like that's a lot of hard work. And, you know, just being able to do it this year was definitely successful for me. So we've talked a lot about hard work. Let's go into a little bit of fun here. So let's talk about, you know, if you work hard, you got to play hard too. And anybody that follows Presley Harvin, the third P at P Harvin 27, you know that the guy likes cars a little bit. Yeah, man, I love cars. That's my second. That's my second hobby besides punting, and I've I've been in cars ever since I was younger. Dude, so you've got a Dodge Dart. It's got a name. It's got an Instagram handle. Tell us a little bit about that, and I'm also interested to know what's your dream car. Is it a Corvette? Yeah. So uh, to start out, yeah, I got a little Dodge Dart. Uh, it definitely does not look like the name sounds or what you would think it would look like. Uh, uh, but I put a lot of hard work in that. I had that since my junior year of high school and I didn't really do anything to it in high school, but when I got to Atlanta, the culture got to me quick. But when I say the culture, I mean the car culture. Uh, I know multiple different guys around the car community that drive a, a lot of different things. I'm best friends with a, with a shop owner that's like 20 minutes outside the city and that he kind of took me under his wing and showed me a lot to do with cars, cosmetically and a lot of other things too. And, you know, that was one thing that I kind of took, like, if I can't play football right now, what am I going to do to try to get better at? And cars is an excellent hobby to get into because every single year a new one comes out. One of my dream cars is definitely a Corvette. And i uh, got a best friend here, plays with me also. He's going to be at Pro Day because he's graduating this semester too. His name is Josh Blancato. And he's actually one of the gunners that I had on punt team this year in the last couple of years too. And me and Josh are real close. Uh, we came into Tech at the same time, kind of with the same aspirations, uh, but, went, but went two different routes. So he's also a prestigious guy in the classroom. He He's getting his degree in automotive engineering uh, as his concentration, but mechanical engineering. And that's what I came in at. But I've quickly learned that uh, playing D1 football <laughs> and doing engineering work was definitely not for me. But uh, took my aspirations to the business schools where I can figure out 
how to earn my own uh, money one day financially, how to be able to run my own business one day because I want to be an entrepreneur and have my own shop one day. And he drives a badass C5 Corvette, makes like close to 450 horsepower, which is ridiculous for that car because it only weighs like 3,200 pounds. And, you know, he, he kind of instilled in me the Corvette life. And that's definitely one of my dream cars, as well as a, a Challenger, a Charger, Hellcat. Uh, those guys, I, I see those cars all the time around Atlanta, uh, like the shops that I go to, car meets and stuff, and just having to share power in those cars are kind of cool to me, and, you know, I want to have one day, because uh, four cylinders aren't enough. <laughs> you know what's funny for me personally? I love hand washing my own car. There's something about just the repetitive motion. I mean... It's almost like kicking, right? We just, it's just, we repeat, we repeat, but there's also that ability to just get better at it and knowing that I can clean my car way better than anybody else. If it wasn't for kicking, I don't think I would love cars as much because, you know, I love kicking to the point where, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a go kick somewhere, I want to at least have my car to look good. And, you know, it was just like a hand in hand thing, like off season cars, in season punting, off season car. And it's just like that repetitive motion, like you said. And like I love and enjoy watching my car. I enjoy like just the motion of doing it. Like you said, it's a little bit different for mine because my car has a lot more different like small grooves and stuff than the Tahoe did. But, you know, just being able to put in a lot of hard work on that and see something that off the field you can do and continue to get better at was just what I was looking for. Uh, work on my car a lot. I also have my own kind of small business that I run that is kind of cool with the name because it came from punting. It's called Fourth Down Customs, and I do a lot of stuff like LED underglow lights. Uh, I do the stars in the ceiling, paint rims, the brake calipers, really just about any type of job that I've learned throughout the four years I've been here in the car community. But now today, I have my own place. I have my own garage downstairs where I can have the space and the time to do it and like good enough weather in the garage if it's not too cold that I can work on my car. And I finally branched out right, I think right in the middle of quarantine around like April or May or so. I branched out and told myself, you know what, look, like if I want to do this and have my own shop one day, I might as well try to learn early while I don't know if the season is going to be here or not. And, you know, I've I've done multiple things on my car now in my garage. Uh, I've worked on multiple different cars and just being able to see the joy in a lot of other people's faces is what I was always waiting to do for car stuff. Just do something nice to their car, make it look different. And just to see the smile on their face that it does that, you know, I the same feeling I get. I want to give to other people. And that's what I've been doing with cars and stuff. So, yeah, uh, it's at Fourth Down Customs on Instagram. Uh, if you're in Atlanta work, I'm in the Atlanta area and you want some work, just hit me up. I'm here and I'm <laughs> available. So this is Presley Harvin, the third. This is Fourth Down Customs. He's talking about it's his small startup. What you can do if you're in Atlanta, hit him up fourth down customs you know as we kind of close this thing up there's something in your engine dude that drives you what is it to be honest i think the biggest thing that drives me is just being able to say like if i did something i was pretty successful at it and just being able to like make my family proud and just have something that one day i can always fall back on and be like you know i did that to the best of my ability and that's really where I got the hard work from was my parents. And they told me they were just at a younger age. Like what also drives me is the fact of, you know, I, my family has a lot of health issues. Uh, like my both of my parents, I've almost lost them multiple times just due to medical stuff. And that's what really drives me every day is, you know, one day, how can I make it to where they don't have to worry about the medical bills? Or if there's something else like a different treatment or something like that that comes up, how can that help them? Not even just just me and my hard work, but how can I pay it forward to them? Because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be in Atlanta right now. I wouldn't be in. I wouldn't be a, almost a college grad. I wouldn't be the Ray Guy winner. And just being able to, you know, every day learn something new off the field that's going to potentially get me there after after football. Because like we all know, NFL just doesn't stand for the National Football League. It also stands for not for long. Because especially as specialists, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because it's hard to stay in. You can be just as good as you want, but, you know, a lot of specialists get pushed around the team at the team. And at one day that that clock's going to end for you and football will be over. And 
you know, just the hard work that I put in on the field is only one small testament of, you know, what I want to do. Because what I want to do is have my own shop one day and being able to have the networking and the finances behind it for football to be able to get me to that position where one day when football ends, I'm still being able to make money and be an entrepreneur. And that's really what drives me is just the the notion of, you know, what I'm doing right now is going to directly correlate to what I want to do in the future from like 10 to 15, 20 years down the road. And just being able to, you know, blessed to have both of my parents here because the road has been hard for both of them. And that's just what motivates me to be the best me every single day. I also have a younger brother. He's actually a sophomore in high school right now. And he's the same way. He doesn't really enjoy cars like I do, but he kind of does. He wants me to work on his, but you know, he doesn't play football and he's in band just like I was. So like I have another aspect of my life to where if I, if football doesn't work out or if car stuff doesn't work out, you know, how can I be musically and use my act, my talent in that to, you know, try to make some money and try to make ends meet and stuff like that. But, you know, it all comes back to my parents and that's what definitely drives me and what motivates me every single day. So you brought up your saxophone playing uh, on your pregame playlist. I don't know if you knew this, but on my pregame play- playlist, I actually had Flamenco Sketches by Miles Davis. I also love John Coltrane. No, that's pretty diverse there, bud. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's cool, man. I mean, you know, I, playing sax, I love Kenny G. So, like, that's usually what I listen to a lot, too. And a lot of jazz music. And, you know, you know, music has always been a background of mine. And... You know, music is just more than just listening to a song. I listen to try to like the chord progressions. I listen to every small bit of the beat and, you know, just being like being in the music talent of, you know, being able to learn how to play instruments and stuff like that was something else that I wanted to do. Like my mom told me, like, look, I don't care if you're going to high school and one day you go to college for football, but you're going to play saxophone in, in the band in high school. So all, just about all four years I played and I truly enjoyed it. And looking back on it, I'm kind of thankful I did because, you know, I still got friends in the high school band that I had. And just being able to, you know, have something like music that a lot of people cherish, but I got a different kind of like experience to it and like a different outlook on it. You know, that's just something else I love too. I had Joe Sterniolo on the podcast. He's another, uh, speaking of Atlanta, he's the kicking coach at Westminster High School in Atlanta where Harrison Butker went. And apparently there's a little game called punt golf that you like. That's my game right there, man. <laughs> so <laughs> funny story about that. I think the origins actually came from Westminster High School with Harrison. And like we all know, Harrison probably can't punt a football probably at all at a good level but you know that game i've played i can't even count how many times i played it in the last four years here at tech and punk golf is just something that any long snapper any punter and any kicker can play a game and the boundaries are not set at all <laughs> like sometimes uh some games we'll play and we actually played it a lot this year because like we also had a lot of ota style practices and stuff like that stuff like, like specialists aren't really engaged in but we all wanted to you know try to play a game from a safe level of you know how can all of us play a game and be safe but also be able to you know have a bonding experience and punk golf is all of that in one and to be honest I, I don't care what school you're at you should play punk golf if you got the field to play it you should play it so basically what the game is you you pick a destination where you want to go just like golf you pick a hole pick how many strokes you want to get to the hole. <laughs> and ever ever since, like, I first got here, that game has been something that, you know, all specialists play. Uh, I've been in four different specialist groups now because of four years at Tech, and all of the all of the specialist groups love to play it. And every time we do, you know, I don't win all of them. I mean, it's, it is punting, but I have not won all of them. You got, like, second-string long snappers that come in and whip – our butts one day then you got kickers that come in and hit turnover balls just about every single (laughs) long hit that they have and you know it's just a game that a lot of specialists should be able to play if you have the uh the field to be able to do it and actually a funny story is i kind of brought it up but didn't realize it was already a thing when i got to tech uh when i was in high school we played something similar to it but it was a tennis aspect so we had like a field goal of pvc pipes 
on a field that was like maybe like 60 yards long and it's just two on two and you kick that ball wherever it is in between the uprights uh if it goes over to the other team it has to stay in play but it was just a game of can you catch a punt and can you place a punt and that's just something that you know me as a punter always wanted to get better at but being able to do it on a competition level that isn't just big ball or situational ball you know being able to have fun with it is definitely you know something that i've always wanted to do when i got to high school and when i got to college and then figured out that you know oh punt golf's here i got a lot more field to work with so i might as well play this one and you know i'm, I'm truly thankful that you know Harrison brought that over from Westminster, and that's definitely something that I think is going to be at Tech for a long time. The McGahee Cup, you are on the first Team USA that will face Australia. The McGahee Cup is named after special teams coordinator in the New York, for the New York Giants and my special teams coordinator at LSU, Thomas McGahee Jr. And basically what, we, we've, what I figured out was we've got a lot of Australians that are playing college football. So out of the top players in college football this year you've got the top eight americans you have the top eight australians if this event happens what would it mean to you to play a game where you're representing your country versus you know the best punters in the world that would be an honor man and that kind of would be like the special teams like special olympics for us (laughs) like a specialist olympics type deal and you know i know a lot of those guys on those lists uh I actually punted with Jake Camarda this past weekend, just getting some more training in. And, you know, just being honored to be on this list, if it happens or if it doesn't, you know, I'm always going to be honored for it. But I really, really want this to happen because these are two different styles and two different cultures of punting. And the the other the other question that, that that I had for fun was, dude, you've thrown for a touchdown. And I recently had Cade York and, and Will Reichert on. Now that you've thrown a touchdown, would you rather throw another touchdown or would you want to run one in? <laughs> I mean, I was definitely truly blessed to throw that touchdown. And to be honest, if I had to throw one or run one, I want to run one this time. And like, I'm a big dude. Like right now I sit at about 265 ish pounds and I'm not the typical size for a punter. And, you know, having, having come playing football from since I could remember when I was like eight years old, I always was on the offensive line. I never got to run the ball. And then one thing, so this is a funny story too. My dad made a bet with me my freshman year. He was like, Trey, look, one day, if you throw a touchdown or run in a touchdown, I'll give you 50 bucks. I got my 50 bucks <laughs> because I threw one. But, you know, ever since high school, I was like, man, you got to just – Forget what the special teams coach say. Just run it. Just run it. If you got it, just run it. And I'm like, man, I can't do that. But, you know, for all of the coaches that's going to be listening to this from the next level, like, look, I will run the ball. I will try to run someone over. And probably because of my size, I'll probably be able to do it. You know, it was a lot of practice to go into that throw and to be able to make it like I did, you know, because it was it was really a dime. It was right on the money. And to be honest, I thought he missed it at first. I thought he didn't catch it or didn't get in. Because we were only looking for the completion to get us into the red zone. And the next thing I know, when I figured that he he caught it for a touchdown, I went crazy. And just being able to, you know, have moments like those from Tech that, you know, a lot of other schools don't really get to have because that same gunner is now in the NFL with the Jaguars. And that's I think that was like his second touch of the football that entire year. That was his senior year. And being able to do things like that, not just for myself, but just for him too, to see like, the exposure that he got from just that one play this season and then go to pro day and ball out and get up and get to the next level, you know, special plays like that make a difference. Like special teams makes a difference. And, you know, if you're good at it, you're going to get there. People will notice you. And like, just like as a specialist in general, like you got a strong leg and you're consistent and you can hit your ball just about every single time you're going to get noticed. Whether that's the high school level, the collegiate level or the NFL level as an NFL agent, I mean, an NFL free agent, you're going to get noticed and, you know, but definitely if I got to run one, I want to run one instead of throwing one next time. Walk me through your goals in high school at that level, your, which was national exposure, right? Coming from small Alkaloo to get national exposure. What were your goals in college? And then what are your goals now? Uh, me and my mom went to this like NFL seminar thing they had back in high school for me. And 
it was it's one little piece of paper like a graphic that's out of the whole book and it just shows that the different percentage levels of high schools and high school athletes how many of them go to college how many of them go to d1 and then how many that of that percentage that's already small goes to the league and ever since i like that first day we put that on the refrigerator because it's the refrigerator is right by the kitchen door where you walk out and every single day back in high school, I would look at it and tell myself, I'm trying to be in that percentage. I'm trying to be in a percentage to go to uh, college and, you know, get national exposure to where I can go to a college for free. And, you know, my goals back in high school was be the best I could be. Uh, that doesn't even mean, like, I have to be ranked number one in the nation. It was never That was never really anything that I, stri- I strive for. I was just trying to strive to be the best I could be. Uh, another goal was academics. Because if you don't have that off the field, you're not going to be able to get to any type of goal you want to get to on the field. Uh, another one, another goal back in high school was being able to go somewhere for free for on a scholarship. And, you know, all three of those goals, I were actually blessed to be able to meet uh, here at Georgia Tech. And then when I got here, the goals was just, you know, be myself in the classroom uh, continue to try to do the hard work to get my degree because that was first and foremost because this school is hard like a lot of other schools don't have the same type of education we have here like they say business is like the easiest uh, the easiest major here but also our business school is like number six seven in the nation which is ridiculous and that's not easy and you know I told myself like look academics are going to come first in college because being able to get a college degree is a blessing but being able to get one from Georgia Tech is no other than really just about any other school besides Ivy League, because mm-hmm. as well as Rice, like, you know, like school's hard. And, you know, I think there's a statistic for us that one out of every six or one out of every five Georgia Tech graduates become a millionaire in life. And when I knew that coming, yeah, when I knew that coming into it, I was just like, yep, if it's not going to be on the field, it has to be from the classroom. So uh, the next goal was just to you know, try to make myself into the best man I could be because I came in at 18 years old. Now here I am 22. I'm a completely different guy now than I was back then. And these four years change you. Like by far, a lot of people say that college experience and the college years that you have are the best years you'll have. It definitely is. But, you know, being able to have the accountability, being able to learn the time management skills, being able to be on my own, and like, as I am to now, like I've had my own apartment for two years now, being able to budget money, being able to, you know, the do's and the don'ts of kind of getting into the adult life is another goal that I set for myself. And, you know, definitely like right now, I'm, I'm in a good situation where that goal is going to get met after I get out of here too. And the last goal was just, you know, do as best as I can on the field and have that work for me. So when I, when I ever get an opportunity to get to the next level, the finances and all of the hardships and stuff that my, me and my family have to go through will be ended. So that's the last goal that I had. And the goals for me right now, after coming out of college and after finishing playing ball, is just continue to be the best me. And really, I missed the biggest goal of all is just to keep God first, like on any level like that. That's that's the foundation of everything. Your spirit, your spiritual relationship with God is always the first and foremost thing you need to have. But, you know, because my parents always tell me if it's not from him, it doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? And he's blessed me with a lot of talents. He's blessed me with a lot of opportunities. And, you know, I'm thankful and try to take advantage of all of them. And if it's it's keep God first for right now, stay level headed, because this process of coming out of college and going into pro day, that's three days, that three weeks away from tomorrow on March 16th. And having these talks with, with teams and special team coaches is hard. And it's just like the recruiting process all over again, but it's a completely different monster because this is strictly a business at this level. And you just have to you know, be yourself. That's another goal is just continuing to be myself, knowing knowing my worth off the field because, you know, I'm, I'm worth something to a lot of people. And, you know, you have to know yourself and able to and in order to be yourself. So just know, continue to know myself, uh, continue to try to be the loving son like my parents have always wanted me to be, uh, and just really just, you know, a step into the adult world, like I said before about the collegiate level of just like not being scared to overcome hardships, 
adversity is going to come like I've always had in my life. But the adversity of the real world is something serious. And like, you know it too, like coming straight out of uh, college, when you came to tech, you really didn't know how it was going to go for you. But look where you are today. And that's the hard work we talked about before. And it's just like continuing to just put that in. And, you know, every goal and aspiration I have in the NFL of being a Pro Bowl punter, being one of the ones that will potentially go down in the record books of the College Football Hall of Fame. And, you know, being able to try to be one of those guys with Ray Guy and be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame is, you know, one of my major goals I want to get to. But, you know, all of the goals that I've set along the way have gotten me to where I am today. And it's just like almost like that climax of the book is coming up for me. And, you know, draft day is coming up soon. And if I even if I don't get drafted, you know, I just want one opportunity with one team. And I promise they won't make the wrong. They would not have made the wrong mistake. And that's just really what my goals are for right now, too. Before kicking and all that, like and outside of that, you are a fantastic human being that's going to make a huge like your life is already a permanent gift. It is what it is. You don't have to you don't have to kick another ball to be, you know, and, you know, I know this is simple kicking. It's all about football and all that. But anyway, I just wanted to drop that because I'm just highly impressed um, this is every single punt from the uh, NFL season about halfway through with the spray chart. Coaches on the NFL level want different things. And like you see a lot of these punters that a lot of them like this one right here from the Bills. Uh, he has a lot more in the boundaries, like a lot of a lot of special teams. Coaches like to look for those uh, instead of, you know, hitting more so inside the field to where they have a stronger net of how the how the punt team fans out just seeing these numbers and stuff broken down like this, like I, to be honest, there's no one else that's doing this type of stuff. Like you are James. Like I, I even did my own kind of research behind it and, you know, look at your app and all of like the different things that you sent me before. And it's just like, this is ridiculous because before like punting and kicking in general was never like this statistically and like logistically shown. It was just, did he make it? Did he miss it? And it, that was just the only checkbox you had. And, like, just being able to see this stuff like you have right here and see the inside of the 50s, the over the five second hang marks, the touchbacks, and being able to pinpoint where every single ball went and where he hit it from. Man, this is this is real, real good stuff. And you know, people should take advantage of this stuff more than any time, especially for right now, because you don't even have to just do this from the NFL level. You got You can get high school guys to do this after just one one charting session they have or one like practice session they have and just being able to see all of this stuff just finally fold together like this is something that is going to take punting to the next level especially coaching like this is a big coaching part for a lot of guys that you know when you have special teams coaches that are looking for people back in the high school level to get to college and you see these spreadsheets come in instead of okay well what was their average you know, where do they usually kick from? And, you know, how high can they kick it? How much hang time? Like, this shows a lot more than that. And you know, this is a this is something that I'm going to take seriously and, you know, continue to try to make myself better. Like if I got to if I got to know, like what, especially in my shoes right now, like I'm seeing week in and week out, what's the average in the NFL and trying to line myself into that and where do I fit in? You know, it's a lot easier to see, like, I can actually do this like because like every punter knows like the difference between a college punter and an NFL punter is ridiculous. But when you break it down like this, you can even you, like I'm pretty sure you have my numbers set and stuff, too. Like you can see the difference between an NFL punter and a, and a college punter right here. You don't even have to look at the film. This breaks it all down in one. You know, this is this is really good stuff. I'm new to this and I'm not even in it yet, but I've I've noticed like. A lot of special teams coaches aren't looking for the biggest ball every single time. They're looking at the accuracy, and that's what gets you paid. Like the coach that I go to, his name is Anthony Giuliano from Coles. He actually trained Brad too throughout college, and like to see where, like to see these numbers and to see how similar they are to mine, man, it's it's pretty cool. Presley, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. And man, your story is totally inspiring, and I'm really excited to see what happens for you moving forward. Really appreciate it, man. It's an honor for being on here. Uh, and like just one more thing I got to say for all of the athletes that are out there, specialists too, man, just keep grinding. Times are hard, but, you know, hard work comes in the hardest times of your life, which is right now throughout this pandemic stuff we've been dealing with and also just continue to have that one step forward and you just keep working. If you enjoyed the content, 
man, drop a like, comment, or even subscribe. It would be really cool to hear from you. Also, you can find Simple Kicking on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and even TikTok.